Hello all, Rick here with a personnel file on my favourite? Yeah, my favourite character from Star Trek's original series, the grumpy doctor Bones McCoy. So before we start this breakdown of his career, there's actually doubt whether or not he is a graduate of Starfleet Academy, with accounts from both. While he most definitely does join Starfleet in the end, Starfleet does not require medical practitioners to have passed through the Academy first, and students of medicine have multiple avenues into the organisation. The Kelvin timeline, McCoy joined Starfleet in 2255, two years later than his prime timeline counterpart, but both actually have similar histories, including a prior medical background and a divorce. Still. This personnel file is for the Prime Universe, Leonard McCoy, so let's get started. Leonard McCoy was born to Eleonora McCoy and David Andrew McCoy in 2227 in Georgia, USA, Earth. He had two brothers, Henry and Landor, and two sisters, Melissa and Elizabeth. As a child, he respected his grandfather's position as Chief of Medicine at Emory University, which left a lingering curiosity in medicine within the young Leonard. At the age of four, he visited Aberdeen and made childhood friends with the young Montgomery Scott, but the two parted ways. At the age of seven, in 2234, his cousin perished on a river trip on the Chattahoochee River. In 2236, McCoy befriended Mark Rossiou, and this friendship lasted until he joined Starfleet Academy in 2243, while McCoy would be applying for medical schools. That same year, he suffered a mild concussion when he was thrown from a horse. He met his future wife, Jocelyn Darnell, in 2244. McCoy entered into the University of Mississippi in 2245 to pursue a medical career, although he was uncertain which field or even direction his studies in science and medicine would take him. That year he met Emery Dax at the University of Mississippi, while she was acting as a judge on a gymnastics competition and possibly had a romantic encounter. Also, in his first year, he visited the USS Hood NCC-1703 as a medical observer. In 2249, he entered medical school and married Jocelyn Darnell. That year, he had their first child together, Joanna McCoy. In 2251, McCoy was appointed lead of an inoculation program on Dramia II against a Saurian viral outbreak. While this was successful, the following illness devastated the colony. This was his first time in command of a medical expedition for the Federation. In 2253, McCoy pioneered a surgical procedure on the brain that was still utilised over a century later. However, this year he divorced from Jocelyn and fell into depression. In order to combat this, he made a spur-of-the-moment decision to sign up to Starfleet and practice medicine away from Earth enlisting at Jackson Mall. Because of how Starfleet works, individuals who have graduated from medical schools need not pass through Starfleet Academy to become officers in that field. Considering his already extensive medical career, within a year he was made junior medical officer on the USS Republic NCC-1371 under the CMO Vincent Bardo at the rank of Ensign. In 2254, he was requested as the chief medical officer aboard the USS Richard Feynman under Captain Mark Rossiou. He was promoted to lieutenant, however, he was reduced to junior officer later that year and transferred to the USS Coop, then to Starbase 7. He moved to live on the nearby Alpha Centauri. While at Starbase 7, Alpha Centauri system, he rose to chief medical officer there and met Lieutenant James Kirk for the first time, who was on the USS Farragut and on rest and rehabilitation. The two would stay in touch, and Kirk would often swing by McCoy's home whenever he was in system. In 2257, McCoy transferred to the USS Constitution NCC-1700 to learn from its CMO, Christina Velasquez. From this point until 2262, it seems he was on assignment to various other ships and installations, varying positions from chief medical officer to junior officers, depending on where he was needed. In 2262, McCoy moved back to Earth to teach at Starfleet Teaching Hospital, meeting both Carol Marcus and Christine Chapel, where he also met Kirk in person once more. In 2264, Captain Kirk requested McCoy to serve as his chief medical officer for his new command, the USS Enterprise NCC-1701. However, McCoy initially accepted, 
but his father had become gravely ill, changing his plans. In 2264, McCoy later deactivated his father's life support on his wishes, but was aghast to learn that a cure for Pironiotiris was discovered only a week later. When he returned to duty, he was asked to lead a mission to Capella IV. This posting was a mixed bag, as the populace intensely distrusted most sciences. In 2266, he was still on Capella IV for a few more months, but requested a transfer to the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 to sign on as the Chief Medical Officer on its next five-year mission under Captain Kirk, replacing Dr. Mark Piper. He was promoted to Lieutenant Commander. The divorce papers of Jocelyn Darnell were finally signed in 2266. In 2267, McCoy accidentally altered time when he encountered the Guardian of Forever. The next year, he saved the life of Ambassador Sarek when he performed heart surgery. In 2268, he was diagnosed with xenopolysythemia, but cured by the generational planetoid Yondala, where he also married the Fabrini leader Natira. In 2269, he was promoted to the rank of commander. In 2270, he was arrested for his actions during the Dramia event years earlier, but acquitted as he was not responsible for the subsequent plague that undid his work. He derived a cure for this new plague, and was honoured for his further contributions. By 2270, Leonard McCoy was considering resigning from Starfleet, and did so on the completion of the Enterprise's five-year mission. He signed on to the Federation Frontier Medic program and acquired his own medical ship named the Joanna. During this time, he travelled around with a small medical team, responding to illnesses and medical distresses as he was able. Among his exploits was the spreading of the cure to xenopolysythemia. As Beja approached Earth, however, in 2272 he was called back by Starfleet to assist and took up his role on the newly refitted USS Enterprise. In 2273, he officially rejoined Starfleet at the rank of commander. In 2276, he was made captain of the Enterprise by Kirk, while the latter undertook a diplomatic mission to flyspeck. What was supposed to be a day-long command turned into a week-long one, much to his dismay. In 2285, McCoy was present for the detonation of the Genesis device and acted as the recipient of Spock's Catra. This had him acting erratically, and demanded that he be brought to Mount Salea on Vulcan. He partook in the theft of the Enterprise later that year, and the return of Spock to Vulcan. There, Spock's Catra was extracted and returned to the science officer. He returned to Earth to face court-martial for his actions on the purloined HMS Bounty. The subsequent saving of the Earth from the Whale Probe earned him a pardon for his part. He was assigned to the USS Enterprise NCC-1701A as the Chief Medical Officer and took part in the exploration of Shakari in 2287. In 2293, he failed to save the life of Klingon Chancellor Gorkum and was arrested by the Klingon High Council and sent to Rura Pente. He was rescued soon thereafter. The next year, he was promoted to Chief Starfleet Medical Advisor, and while not present for the launch of the Enterprise B, he would visit a year later in this capacity to assist with a Torellian plague, and served as the Chief Medical Officer for a time. In 2296, he served on the USS Intrepid II under Captain Spock. In 2300, McCoy returned to Earth once more, taking up a teaching role at Starfleet Medical Academy once again, which came with a promotion to Branch Admiral in rank, although this applied only to Starfleet Medical, eventually rising to the head of this institution. After this, he was also given the position of Starfleet Medical Surgeon General for a time, and Chief of Starfleet Medical. In 2336, at the age of 109, he took up research posting at Starfleet Medical, where he remained until his retirement in 2353. Occasionally, he would undertake lecturing roles and act as a guest at various medical conferences. He intended to be there for the launch of the Enterprise D in 2363, but an injury prevented him attending. Instead, he arranged transport to Farpoint Station to get a tour of the vessel, where he met the medical team on the vessel and Lieutenant Commander Data. In 2371, he returned to the Enterprise after Ambassador Spock had been captured by the Romulan government in retaliation to his unificationist movements, and accidentally tipped off the Romulans that they had captured Spock, who until this moment, they had assumed he was simply a member of the movement. 
McCoy was retired completely by 2379, although would still feature as a guest of honour or embark on medical missions to local Federation settlements as late as 2381. His ultimate fate is not established as of yet in canon or apocrypha. So, in terms of a legacy, much of his work ended up becoming required reading, and his accumulated knowledge was published in several journals. These would go on to be implemented in even the holographic doctors like the EMH program. A fact that I do enjoy is that alongside Ambassador Spock, he's one of the only couple of original Enterprise crew members to live into the late 24th century, while Kirk and Scotty were skipped forwards in time. In terms of hobbies, he did enjoy a drink and accumulated his own stash of vintages and spirits for recreational use with his closest friends. Occasionally he was known to experiment with them and mix up his own concoctions. His youth mentioned various other outdoor activities such as skiing, rafting and horse riding as hobbies, although it seems most of these were not continued into his adult life. The fact that he never passed through Starfleet Academy in the Prime Timeline has led him to have somewhat of an outsider perspective on Starfleet and how a ship is run, often making observations based on more of a moral standpoint without consideration for regulations or letting red tape get in the way. That being said, he understands that as a part of Starfleet, he is held accountable for certain actions and does respect the institution. But as seen by his career, with or without them, he would be doing his best to heal people. This left him often being a plain-spoken individual and unafraid to challenge his superiors. The trio of Kirk, Spock and McCoy is not only the core friendship of the series, but a very in-universe reason for Kirk's success in Starfleet, as Spock and Bones spoke to elements of Kirk's own personality and gave voice to often differing opinions in times where he needed counsel. One trait of McCoy that I really enjoy is that despite his curmudgeonly demeanour, he actually has a pretty healthy attitude to most of life's challenges. At some of the darkest moments of his life, after the divorce, his father's death, he takes time to mourn, but then subsequently takes action to avoid slipping into depression. In both of these instances, he turned to Starfleet, and this might be seen as an escape, for sure in part it is, but it fuels his desire to help others, to prove useful, and moreover, to keep himself distracted and adamantly against melancholy. It's a brilliant contradiction in his character that much of his outward griping and complaining is a pretty healthy way of venting his frustrations and pessimism without it eating away at him. He forges lasting friendships and is a stalwart, loyal comrade to his crew. Whenever he is called on for aid, he is there for them, even if he is off enjoying retirement. Despite his often passionate and vocalness on most matters, he does have a hard time expressing his genuine feelings to others for sure, often masking it with wit, sarcasm and dryness. But it's clear that beneath it all, he completely cares, not only for his friends, but for life in general, the core of a doctor. One well-known quirk of his personality is his mistrust of technology, except that of medical science with the transporter being a personal phobia, although he did not let that impact his work. He also displayed a distaste for any technology that removed the human and emotional element from things, extensive automation for example, believing that the emotional experience was integral to life. Some McCoy-centric episodes that I think are worth a watch are For the World is Hollow and I Have Touched the Sky, to see him struggle with, well, a lot. Prime Directive, Love, Mortality, and more. The Tholian Web is a strong Spock episode, but without Kirk, we also get to see Bones' handling of his responsibilities as the Chief Medical Officer and how it brings him into conflict with Spock's decision making. And, funnily enough, I adopt for Star Trek V. Despite the rap that film gets, I gotta say McCoy gets some great development in that film and some so late in his portrayal but still critical to his character. So what would your additions to these choices be? Honestly, as one of the three primary cast, he gets so many moments peppered throughout the series that it's kinda hard to pick an episode where I want to include numerous scenes instead. Thanks for watching this breakdown of Leonard Bones McCoy. I've been Rick and I'll see you later. Thanks again and goodbye.